We get to the scripture, open it to John the 17th chapter. John the 17th chapter and the 17th verse. I'm actually going to read another passage of scripture to go with this before we get into the sermon. But John the 17th chapter and the 17th verse, John the Beloved writes these words that came from the mouth of our Savior. Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. He's praying for me and you. He's praying for them of that day. The prayer still goes for us today. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. In the 8th chapter, the 31st and 32nd verse, it says, then, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, If you continue in My Word, then are ye My disciples indeed. Verse 32 says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So the first passage of Scripture that we read says that Thy Word, talking about the Word of God, Thy Word is truth. If you wonder today what truth is, and especially in the day that we live in, it's kind of hard to nail it down or to find it. So many people today don't know how to speak the truth. They just soon lie to you and look at you. Amen. I've always understood... It's not right, but it's understandable when someone gets backed into a corner and they feel the pressure on and they tell a lie. At least with our carnal mind, though it's wrong, it's not right, with our carnal mind we can understand that. But for people just to lie, one lie right after the other, just for the sake of lying, I've never understood that. And today that's what we have in our society. So if you wonder today, well, what is truth? And so many people searching for truth. This is truth. He said, thy word is truth. He said, if you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth when? When you continue in his word. We've talked about this before. It bears enough importance this morning to talk about it again, Brother Rodney, how important the Word of God is to you. This book is not something you should leave on the pew to save your seat till you get back on Wednesday night, or Tuesday night, as it were, around here. This Word should be a part of your life every day of your life. Every, there's not a day in our life should go by that we do not rely upon, feed upon in some manner or another the Word of God. Jesus would say to the devil when being tempted in the wilderness, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. <laughs> Without this, there is no illumination, Brother Sleece. Without this, there is no real knowledge. Oh, man can have knowledge to a certain degree, carnal knowledge. But real knowledge, real truth comes from this book and the revelation that lies within its, within its leather-bound cover. And Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Many Christians today, and I use that word kind of loosely, walk around bound because they have no relationship, they have no knowledge of God's word. Whenever you begin to read this book, this book reveals to you Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not talking about being able to quote it from front to back. I've met people that can quote it from front to back. But all it is is another book to them. And I say that because it has they've allowed it to have not the impact that God wants it to have on their lives. His Word is truth. His Word is powerful, more powerful than any two-edged sword. There has never a book been written in the history of mankind, in the history of the world that has had the impact of this book. There, there is no other book known to man that has changed as many lives as this book. And it's not the leather-bound cover. 
It's not the nice paper that it's printed on. It's what it reveals to mankind. From Genesis to Revelation, it reveals to us the way, the truth, and the life. It reveals to us Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The Word of God is quick. It is powerful today. This past week during our time in school, Brother Tyler was reading a book called The Tales of Persia. And this book was written by a Presbyterian missionary by the name of William Miller. In 1919, this Presbyterian missionary, William Miller, answered the Lord's call to go to Persia to be a missionary there. And Persia, now known by its ancient name, Iran. And he fell in love with the people there. And his heart was there and his burden, the burden for their souls was there. And in his book that Brother Tyler was reading this week, Tales of Persia, he wrote of his experiences and the people that he led to the Lord. And in the book he told of a man, and I probably won't get his name right. You probably don't know anyway because you've probably never heard of him. You're going to hear about him this morning. But he told of a man by the name of Gason who was a Muslim, Islamic in faith, as most of them were in that land that he went to be the missionary for. Most of them couldn't even read. So they had no knowledge of anything other than that which the leaders told them. Whatever their spiritual leaders might have been or whoever. More educated people because most of them couldn't read. But Gason could read. And in, in order to support his family, he had a little shoe shop that he worked in every day. And every day at lunchtime, he would close his shop and he would go and he would buy some bread and he would buy some cheese from a local place there. And Brother Rodney would take this cheese home with him every day and he would share it with his family. And one day whenever he went in to buy the cheese, the man that owned the store, he sliced the cheese and he wrapped it in some paper out of a book. Now I don't know if the store owner couldn't read or maybe he had no regard whatsoever for what the book was, but he would tear the page out, wrap the cheese in it, and send it home with Gason. And after he got home and after he ate the cheese, Gason noticed that this, pa this paper that the cheese was wrapped in was, had writing on it. And he picked it up and he began to read. And he was so intrigued and so moved by what he read, each day when he would go to the local store there, he would ask the man, would you please wrap it? in the same kind of paper from the same book that you wrapped it before. And each day he would take the cheese home and he would unwrap it and he would read that which was on the page that the cheese was wrapped in. And the more he read, the more he was moved. And the more he read, the more it caused him to want to read more. Till finally he went one day and the storekeeper said, Listen, I know you're always asking for the pages out of this one book I've been using. Do you want what's left? If you want to, I'll sell you what's left of this book that I've been tearing the pages out of. He said, Yes, I want the book. So he sells him his cheese and he sells him what's left of the book. And he takes it home and he reads it. And this book transforms what, what is within its pages transforms the life of Gesem and his brother Muhammad and saves his family. This book was a New Testament that had been translated into the Persian language. I'm talking about the power of the Word of God. The fact that this store owner, either he couldn't read it and didn't know what the book was, or his Islamic faith caused him to think, well, that's no more than just a newspaper. So he would... Tear it out, and the missionary that he received it from had passed on. And he would take, and I'm sure that that missionary that whenever he gave that store owner that Bible never thought that the pages of that Bible was going to be used to wrap cheese in. Probably had no idea that he would reach this man named Gason. But each day he would unwrap the cheese and he would read from the pages of that book. And that which was revealed to him from that precious old book was Jesus Christ. And it caused him and his family to be saved. I'm talking about the power of the Word of God today. This man saved, brought to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ.
Thy word is truth. If you continue in my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This man and his family, when they knew the truth, when truth was given to them, my, 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 wrapped around a piece of cheese. That's how powerful the Word of God is. The Word of God is powerful enough to change your life. The revelation that it brings to you will change your life. This book today is truth. John, the fourth chapter, the fourth verse. Jesus speaking to the devil in the wilderness said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus spoke to the religious men in his day concerning the scriptures. Now, they didn't have the entirety of the book as we do, but they had the Old Testament scriptures. And he spoke to the men concerning the scriptures, Brother Sleason, he said, Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. Now, you've got to understand, these men thought the simple fact that they knew it, hid knowledge, the simple fact that they knew it by heart, the Torah, as it were, the Old Testament, the writings of the prophets, whatever it was they had in order to be able to memorize it, they thought it made them more holy if they could quote more of the book. It's not, it's not having the book up here that makes you closer to God. It's having the book here that makes you closer to God. The words of God. And Jesus said, search the Scriptures. That's where you believe your eternal life is at. But He didn't stop there. He said, and they are they which testify of me. Those Scriptures that you boast of, that bring you righteousness, that cause you to be holy because you know them. Search them and you'll find me. Because I am the one that the Scriptures testify of. You see, they can see the Scripture. But that's as far as they could see. The man that, that, that Isaiah spoke of as coming from a virgin's womb whose name would be called Counselor and Mighty God stood before them. And they were so blind. They knew the Scripture. They knew the letter. But the letter was dead to them without eyes of faith to see the promised one that stood before them. And Jesus said, search the Scripture. That's where you believe your eternal life's at in knowing the Scriptures. Search them. They testify of me. What saved Gaysom and his family? It wasn't that page out of that book. It wasn't the words there, but it was the one that those words testified of. It was the truth that was revealed to them through the Word of God. And Jesus tells the men of His day, it's the Scriptures that testify of me. And I want you to know this morning that I don't care how extensive your library is, and I don't know how many books some of you out there have. I know that Brother Don Swarthout that I talk to and I record for the radio, we do it over Skype, and I can see his library behind him, and he's got all kinds of books and things. And I know there are a lot of other people that have libraries in their homes. and We've got a public library right across the road. I don't care how extensive your library is or how many books you have in it. None of them, none of them are on the same level as this book right here. None of them are on the same level as this. Thy word is truth. This book has been fought harder than any book in the history of mankind. It's been burnt. It's been buried. It's been shredded. It's been attacked. And it's still here. <laughs> Kings and leaders have decreed that it be closed and never opened by man and burnt. Find every copy you can and burn it all. And it's still here today. Men have given their life for this book that we hold in our hands today. And not so much, and I don't know if you're getting this this morning, but not so much the book, but the truth that it contains the revelation, the one that it testifies of today. John Wycliffe, who was born in 1320 and died in 1384, undertook the first complete English translation before there was even printers. They had to copy. In order to get a copy, it had to be handwritten. 
That's the only way you could get a copy of it because they didn't have the printing sources to be able to print and duplicate copies in bulk. But he incited the Catholic Church so much so that they fought him while he was alive, but that ain't just that ain't the end of it. After he was dead, 30 years after he was dead, the Roman Catholic Church declared that John Wycliffe was a stiff-necked heretic. They banned any of his teachings or writings from the Roman Catholic Church. And they wrote a decree, a decree out, Brothers Lee, that all of his books that they could find were to be burnt. And that they go dig up his bones and burn his bones and scatter them in the river. Thirty years after the man is dead, the fact that he wanted to get the English translation of God's Word into the hands of the common man incited the religious authorities so much so I can see them now. Sleepless nights. Worried about a dead man and the work that he had done. Amen? But it wasn't John Wycliffe that, that they feared. It wasn't William Tyndale that they feared. It was the Word of God in the hands of man that would change the hearts of man, that would reveal to them the truth that they had hidden from them. At the time, the only scripture you heard is whenever you went to Mass or wherever and heard the priest or the bishop or whoever it was at the time to speak it to you in Latin. The enemy did not want it in the hands of man. And you can look beyond the Catholic Church. They were just a pawn in the hand of the devil. The devil did not want the Word of God in the hands of man. He knows if he can get Sleece Butler to believe there are more things important in life than the Word of God. He knows if he can get him to doubt the truth within these covers, he can begin to snuff out the light and the wisdom of God that comes from His Word. Continue in my word and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. It stands to reason we can figure this out with our own carnal mind. If you continue in his word, you'll be made free. If you close his word and you shut it off to your life, you will be in bondage. Because his word, his truth, his revelation of Jesus Christ and him crucified brings freedom to the believer. Otherwise, you spend your whole life trying to work your way to heaven. You spend your whole life trying to do it yourself mm -hmm. until you read the truth in His Word and it's revealed to you that He is the way. Mm -hmm. He is the truth. He is the light. He is the one that imputes righteousness unto man. So 30 years after Wycliffe's dead, he still troubles the Catholic Church so much that they're going to have to dig him up burn his bones and scatter them somewhere. They didn't want the English translation of the Word of God to get into the hands of the common. We've talked about William Tyndale before, but in 1525, William Tyndale would begin his work on translating the Bible into English. If you ever had the opportunity, you should read the life, the story of the life of William Tyndale. <clears throat> This is a man that walked away from the Catholic Church that stood toe to, to toe with them on their doctrine and said that it was incorrect and that they were teaching the people wrong. This is the man that said, if God will allow it before I die, I'm going to make sure that the common man behind the plow has the same access to the Word of God as the Pope does. Oh, you talk about inciting the anger of the religious, religious leaders of that day. He devoted his life so that you could have this book that you allow to gather dust at your home or to save your pew at the church. He gave his... In the end, he would give his life, Brother Sleece, so that we could have this. So that we would be able to understand the Word of God, be able to read it for ourselves. He would incite the anger of the Roman Catholic Church so much that he would have to go into hiding to be able to translate the Word of God. If memory serves me correct, and I may not have all the details right, but at one, in one point they were rounding up all of that that he had translated. They said, we need to get these burnt. We need to get rid of them. We need to get rid of them. We need to burn them. Get our hands on every copy. 
The leaders of the day even said, we'll pay for the copies. Yeah. Tell the people, we'll give you money if you bring us the copies of this heretic's work and we will burn it. We'll give you money. William Tyndale and the ones that, the few people that he had that was helping him, they ran out of money to print any more. And they were trying to figure out how they're going to raise any money. And one of them said, I've got an idea. They're offering money to burn the books. Let's set up a place and tell them we've got some to sell them. So they bought them. They came, they bought them. William Tyndale and his associates took the money and printed more Bibles. <laughs> they were paying top dollar! So not only were they able to replace the one that the leaders burnt, but they got enough money to replace more than the one that the leaders burnt. Anytime the devil tries to squash out the Word of God, it pops up somewhere else. Whenever the leaders came down on the church in the book of Acts and they tried to shut them up, the only thing it did, and it's probably, and there's no doubt probably about it, God's hand allowed it so that the church would spread out. You know, we got a lot of crazy people in America that go find a compound out in the field somewhere in Texas and they say, this is going to be our village. We're going to stay here. We're going to have no doings with the outside world. To keep the early church from getting any ideas like that, the leaders of the day came down on them hard. And when they did, they had to be dispersed. They had to scatter. And when they scattered, they took the message to the four corners of the earth. It didn't no longer stay there. But when the enemy said, we'll stop them, the only thing he did was cause them to, split, to spread out. And when they spread out, they took the message with them. William Tyndale would work his entire life translating. Once he made the decision to translate the Bible into English, his work would be the first one printed on an actual printer in 1536. Would be the first one printed on an actual printer. In 1536, he would be burnt at the stake for his work on translating the Word of God in order for the common man to be able to read God's Word. Think about that the next time you pick up your King James and you read it. Thank God for men like William Tyndale. Thank God for men like John Wycliffe. Thank God for men that had the audacity to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the church of that day and say, God wants every man to have His Word. Not just religious leaders, so that they can dictate the actions of others. So that they can see they would, they, they would use that to teach the people that they need to pay penance. When in actuality, the Bible says you need to repent. Big difference between penance and repentance. That was only one of the truths that slapped the Catholic Church in the face that caused them to be angry enough to either to do it themselves or to incite the leaders of that day because they controlled the leaders to burn those at the stake that would have the audacity to try and put the Word of God into the hands of the common man. William Tyndale's last words, at least recorded by historians, would be a prayer that he said, God, please open the eyes of the King of England. In 1604, King James would commission the greatest scholars of that day. No other scholars could hold a candle to them then. No scholars that we have today can hold a candle to them either. He commissioned them to begin work on the King James Version to be translated into, for the Scripture to be translated into English, which we later we now know today as the King James Version. Seven years later, God's Word would be published in the authoritative version, the authorized version of the King James. This book that we hold in our hand today is a blood-stained book. Mm -hmm. It was not an easy trail to get it from where it was at to your hands today. The devil tried to stop it. The leaders tried to stop it. The church mm -hmm. of that day tried to stop it. Mm -hmm. But God's Word has prevailed. It has been preserved. That's why I don't get so worried whenever people say, well, ain't going to be around much longer. They said that 20 years ago. They said, in 20 years from now, you won't be able to find a King James anywhere. <laughs> Look what I got this morning. Amen. 
Why? Because God has promised to preserve it. From generation to generation, God has promised to preserve His Word. This book today, His Word is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. Without His Word, we will have darkness. Without His Word, we will have no truth because His Word is truth. And I get tickled at these scientists who say, yeah, but the world has to be millions and millions. Some of them, I guess they say billions now. They have to be billions of years old because we found this layer and that layer and this layer. And each one of these layers represents so many billions of years and so many millions of years. Let me give you a little bit of knowledge this morning from a redneck preacher from the hills of Kentucky. You don't know a whole lot, but I know this much. If your knowledge leads you to believe something that opposes or goes against this book, guess whose knowledge is wrong? Amen? Not the book. If your scientific discoveries leads you to a place to where you say, this proves that the Bible ain't right. No, the Bible proves that you ain't right. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen? In the beginning, God created man in His own image. He did not create some little slimy thing that would crawl out onto the bank and that would become something with legs and arms and sooner or later would swing from a tree and now He would be start walking upright like a man and finally He would evolve into a man. No, God created man in His own image. But we found proof. This is proof. This is truth. Anything else that you try to make supersede this book is not true. For thy word is truth. The final authority today is not the American scientist or the scientist from France. The, the final authority is this book. If it goes against the book, it ain't right. The book is. If it goes against the book, not one shovel of dirt has ever been turned over that proved this book wrong. Really? Amen. Mm -hmm. This book, His Word is truth. My Word is truth. God tells man today, my Word is truth. And the enemy knows that. Why do you think that he fights so hard to keep you from the book? Mm -hmm. To keep you from God's truth? He knows if he can cut man off from God's Word, he will starve man to death spiritually. Yeah. He knows mm -hmm. if He can stop and shut up the Word of God in your life that He will cut off the light because Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Mm -hmm. That is why no other book has been attacked like this book. No other men have been attacked like those men who stood for this book. We're seeing it in America today. You can stand for everything. If anybody dares say anything about you, they're judgmental. They're racist. They're biased. They're hate. They're full of hate. But you can stand for men marrying men, men, women marrying women. It won't be long till we'll have them trying to pass the law that it's alright for you to marry a horse. Amen. What's your choice? It's your decision. This is my wife. Henrietta the donkey. There are people that are that sick. Where do you draw the line? God drew the line when He created Adam and Eve and not Adam and Steve. God drew the line whenever He said for a man, it was an abomination for a man to lay with a man. God drew the line whenever He said He gave them over to reprobate minds and then they burned in their, in their lust one for another. Men with men, women with women, doing those things that are unseemly, leaving the natural use of a woman. God already drew the line. Mm -hmm. Amen? Man tries to move it. God's yeah. line hasn't moved. Amen? Mm -hmm. You see this all down through church history. Mm -hmm. They start out saying this is wrong, but then they give him a little bit and the line scooted a little, a little bit. They give him a little bit more and the line's moved a little bit more. God never moved his lines. Mm -hmm. His lines are still in place today. Mm -hmm. Thy word is truth. This book has survived the burnings, the attacks, the, the, the thrown them into the ocean. William Tyndale 
as he was on one of his journeys trying to get away from the persecution, had all of his work with him on the ship, and a storm came, and the ship was tossed to and fro, and the ship was broken asunder. He made his way to land, and history says as he stood there, looking out of the ocean, he saw his work sink to the bottom. Did he say, well, just forget it? No. He just said, I gotta work a little harder. I gotta work a little harder. I gotta work a little harder. Can you imagine how disheartening that could that must have been to stand there and see your work, all of your energy, all of your efforts, the calling that God has on you sink into the water. Devil probably said, Ah, he'll stop now. Mm -hmm. No, he wouldn't. I think I left this out, but in 1611, whenever the King James Version, well, what we have up here today, about 90% of it is the work of William Tyndale. They used, he was one of the translations that the scholars used to make sure that it lined up with the original. They said, you know what, old William, he knew what he was doing. Amen? He knew what he was doing. See, they might say today, well, the King James translators were not inspired. William Tyndale was. They were commissioned by the King of England. William Tyndale was commissioned by the King yeah, of all of glory and all of heaven. Amen? Oh, His Word is truth. God's Word is truth today. And I can't stress it to you enough how important it is that these that this book, that this truth, that this Bible is a part, not of just your life on Sunday mornings, but your everyday life. Because in the world that we live in, if you don't know the truth, you're fixing to be deceived. Mm -hmm. yeah. Every day, it's nothing for every day for me to read some off-the-wall weird doctrine that man has came up with. Yeah. And if I didn't know the book, yeah. I might get up here next Sunday morning mm -hmm. and Tell you that, hey, you're a God. I'm a God. We're all little gods. Yeah, but I know the book. Amen. I might get up here and tell you that Jesus died, went to hell, and was born again as a sinner man if I didn't know the book. Amen. I might get up here next Sunday and tell you you need to come and confess your sins to me and do penance and say, Hail Mary, Mother of God, if I didn't know the book. Amen. I can't stress to you the importance today, Brother Rodney, that you know the book. Not just that your pastor knows it, but that you know it. I challenge you, anything that comes from behind this pulpit, it, go home and search it out. If it ain't there, come to me and tell me. We'll discuss it. We'll say, hey, maybe I missed it. Maybe you just ain't seen it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Anything we preach, anything we teach, if it goes against this book, guess who's wrong? Mm -hmm. It ain't the book, Brother Sleece. It ain't the book. Regardless of what Bill Nye, the science guy, has to say, no matter how smart he is, what lair he has, what fossil he found, if it goes against the book, guess who's wrong? It ain't God. Oh, I can shout this morning, hallelujah. It ain't God, amen? God has already told us that His ways and His thoughts are above our thoughts. You're going to be surprised when we get over in glory, how many things you thought you knew you wasn't right. Amen? Because God's ways and God's thoughts are higher than ours. God's ways, His thoughts, He knows more than we do. Amen? So if you have trouble with the seven days of creation, if you have trouble with Noah's Ark, if you have trouble with the age of the world, and if you say, yeah, but I think yeah, but God says this. And if what you think and what God says don't line up, who do you think is wrong? It ain't God. Amen? I'm trying to hurry. It ain't God. I'm trying to stress to you, and I know I'm, it's a feeble effort and I'm, I'm not a very good preacher, but I'm trying to stress to you today the importance of the Word of God in your life. His Word is truth. And He told us that if we continue in His Word, we would know the truth. Not if we continue in the bestseller on the New York Times selling list today, but if we would continue in His Word, we would know the truth. And the truth will make us free. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words 
shall not pass away. Isaiah would write these words that God spoke to him, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So when your thoughts don't line up with God's, you're wrong. God ain't. Amen? Do you see that this morning? If you go down two verses, he says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. God has preserved His word, and if Brother Rodney decides that he don't believe something in the book, the book ain't wrong, Brother Rodney is. Thy word is truth. Not man's word. Thy word is truth. If scientists tell you we can prove, <laughs> well, if it goes against this, I can prove you're wrong. Because if God said it, that settles it. I don't care if you believe it or not. It doesn't matter if I believe it or not. If God settles it, that if God said it, that settles it. Amen. It is written in something stronger than stone. Never to be removed. He promised us in Psalms the twelfth chapter, and I'm trying to close. Psalms 12 and 6 and 7 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of fire, a furnace of earth, I'm sorry, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Do you hear that? That lets me know that as long as there is, not even just in this life, not even just in this world as we see it, but forever. How long is forever? Forever is forever. There's no time limit set on that. His Word, He is preserved. He will keep it forever. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was the life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Verse 14, the book of John, the first chapter says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Knowing today that His Word is the absolute authority and truth on everything, it reveals to us even more the words of Jesus when He said, If you continue in My words... If you continue in my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How important is it today to make sure that what we teach and that our doctrine lines up with God's word? It's so important that the Apostle Paul wrote, If an angel from heaven comes to you and tells you anything else, let him be accursed. If I come to you and teach you anything else, let him be accursed. I don't know about most of, but I would say the majority of false religions today were started by a man who claimed he had a visitation from an angel. Listen to me. Unless I'm mistaken, Muhammad's was that way. <clears throat> was visited by an angel. Maybe even Joseph Smith, the Mormon guy. But many religions today, because an angel visited a man and told him something, there are fallen angels. Mm -hmm. There are hell's angels. They don't ride motorcycles. Mm -hmm. Amen. If an angel from heaven comes and tells you anything different than this book, guess who's wrong? The angel. If a man comes and tells you anything other than this book, guess who's wrong? The man. Not God. His word is forever settled in heaven, Brother Sleese. And it's important for you to have His Word here. David said, Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. The Bible teaches us to have it written on the tables of our heart today. Thy Word is truth. His Word supersedes everything else. If it goes against... And we know this. I've told you, whenever we talked about the dreams of some of the preachers and their teachings and their doctrines... We always compare it not to our denominational headquarters and what we teach within our denomination because we're not part of a denomination. 
We always compare it to this book. And if it doesn't line up with this book, guess who's wrong? Not the book. If you're teaching, I'm not going to defend these false teachers to you. I'm going to tell you it ain't in the book. It ain't in the book. I've got, I've got Christians that are no longer friends with me because I had the audacity to quote their favorite preacher and say that ain't in the book. If it ain't in the book, see, His Word is truth. If it, line, if it does not line up, I've heard preachers say, well, you can't find this in the Bible. You have to get this by personal revelation. If your personal revelation, I don't care if you heard the thunder. I don't care if you saw it lightning. I don't care if you heard a thunder and voice booming into your ears. If it goes against the book, it was not God. This is truth. And anything that goes against it is not when the disciples came to Jesus and said, What shall the sign of the end of your end of the end be in the sign of your coming? He said, Take heed that no man deceive you. He went on to tell the other signs, but that's the first sign that he said. Without the knowledge of the Word of God today, you can be deceived. But if you know the book, when they come around spewing their foolish stuff that they spew today, you can say, Wait a minute, that don't line up with the book. I'm convinced today that there would not be a mega church left in America if the people in the pews knew what the book said mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and realized what their preacher was preaching wasn't in it. Mm -hmm. Right. They'd get up and walk out. Mm -hmm. Know the book for yourself. Know that it is the truth. And anything, let it be the weight and the litmus test for everything in your life. If it goes against the book, it ain't of God. Someone else this morning have something before we go.